So what um, we tried to do in this uh, presentation is give you a little bit more detail from the video in terms of what we do uh, in our operation. So uh, from a just starting point, I'll give you a couple of, of pictures. This is what it looks like in the summer, and this is what it looks like today. So you're probably familiar with that. My background really isn't agriculture. I wasn't born on a farmer or uh, didn't go through any formal training. It was uh, uh, very much in the, uh, in the technology field. But we, um, we, we bought 80 acres of land in, in Manitoba because that was the minimum you could buy in the country. So uh, 80 acres was too much to mow and we thought sheep were easy. We could just send them out there, they'd eat the grass and at the end of the season they'd go to market and it would be easy. Well, <clears throat> it turned out a little different than we uh, expected, but uh, we've evolved uh, over the time. And I think one of the, the keys for us, and again, it somewhat reflects my technology background, but we've always, from the very beginning, maintained uh, uh, detailed records about our sheep production and, our, uh, and about our investment and our, and our finances. And because I, uh, over the years, have lived in the U.S., my requirements for reporting were somewhat more extensive than they might be if I had stayed in Canada. So that also encouraged uh, b a better record keeping. But I think it's valuable, and as you get larger, it's, uh, it's critical because it's impossible to figure out uh, what investments are worthwhile and, and what's producing a return. Some, we didn't have uh, a professional photography, so many of these photographs were taken with a cell phone. But one of the things we're, we're trying to show here, this is an example of, of quads. And what I really wanted to show is not only the quads, but the size of the quads. And, and this, this is what we've worked on uh, in, in order to, 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 to grow our operation, we've, we've always focused on retaining ewes that are self-sufficient. And at the beginning, when we were starting to get quads from our uh, Rideau flock, the animals were too small, the lambs were too small, we had too much mortality. And, and at the beginning, we had fins and, and Rideaus, and, and the fins were even worse. So what we looked for was animals that could and would deliver quads, uh, but would deliver them at a size that allowed them to be self-sufficient. And so this is what we're seeing today. In fact, the other day we had a quint, and I didn't have my phone with me, so I wasn't able to take a picture. But the, uh, the quints are, are also reasonable size. The smallest quints are two and a half kilograms, and the largest was four kilograms in the, uh, in the group. So that's what we've discovered is one of the keys for us to be able to do this with minimal management. You don't, uh, you don't want to be out there bottle feeding all of these lambs. They've got to be able to uh, stay with the mother, uh, get started, get colostrum from the mother, be strong enough to get up and, and, uh, and get that first feeding so that when we take them away to the nursery, they're, they're, they have a good start, they're ready to go. So, you know, our, our objective is to make a profit, right? So the, the keys that we've determined in, in making a profit really are outlined here. These are the, these are the objectives. We're, we haven't achieved all these objectives, but these are the objectives that we work towards. And the, the number one objective has always been to minimize the labor component of what we do. Uh, first of all, I wasn't there, so we were hiring all of the people who worked on the farm. But that's not really the issue. The issue is there are no capable, competent, motivated people available to uh, be hired to work on the farm. So you've got to find a way where with a very small amount of labor you can manage. And, and the way to do that is to have your ewes look after themselves. And that's really been the, the focus of, of our operation is ewes that will look after themselves but at the same time will produce uh, 3.4 lambs per year. And, uh, and, and I, this is a very achievable objective today. Uh, once, you, once you get beyond a yearling, the sort of we see the years three to eight, uh, th this is the kind of results that can be achieved today and, uh, and that we are achieving in those, uh, in those mature ewes. Uh, equally important is that the mortality level uh, gets down to a, a, a you know, sub 10%. I, I think a lot of people have sort of come to accept that the 15 to 20% mortality in a, in a multi, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a multiple lambing environment is acceptable. I, I don't think it is, and certainly from an economic perspective, there's a very big difference to uh, having a mortality rate that's sub 10 uh, compared to something which is you know, closer to 20, which, uh, which I think a lot of people are having to live with today. 
and, and of course, from a cost perspective, feed is the biggest issue that uh, we all have to deal with. Our operation is primarily confinement. We, uh, we have pasture, 80 acres of pasture that we use uh, in the summer, but our ewes are, are only on pasture in months uh, two, three, and four of the cycle. We breed in the corral and um, we start feeding the uh, lactation rats a month before, so they're back in the corral for the final month. And the, the reason is we're lambing every eight months and we're expecting our ewes to have triplets. They just can't maintain, our ewes cannot maintain enough condition uh, strictly on pasture during that time frame. And, and finally, from a marketing perspective, we've worked hard to uh, establish our brand so that people understand if they're looking to buy replacements, they're buying replacements that have these characteristics. Uh, they're not buying a Suffolk, they're buying a, uh, a Rideau Cross or Rideau U, and uh, that animal will produce multiple lambs per year, but it will not look like a Suffolk. It'll never look like a Suffolk, and I think it's important that people understand, and it's, therefore it's important that you establish a reputation for your operation so that when people are looking to buy replacements, they know what they're coming for. All right, this is another group of, uh, of quads. So our, this is our operation. We have uh, about 2,350 ewes. Uh, uh, the, uh, we, we've gone through a variety of iterations as we started with the pure Suffolk. We uh, introduced the Finn uh, and then the Rideau. We bred Suffolk rams back to uh, Rideau ewes and we certainly liked the, uh, the carcasses. That's when we were selling into the U.S. The, uh, the Rideau ewes were quite successfully delivering from a Suffolk ram and we were selling them in the U.S. 140 pounds, which was great. But when they closed the border down and we had to sell to Toronto, that was no longer an acceptable market. The uh, lambs were too big for the Toronto market and nobody wanted to pay for uh, a carcass that, uh, that wasn't finished if we shipped it at 100 pounds. So we went back to the straight Rideaus and, uh, because that's what the Toronto market was looking for and that's where we sell. So the, um, the, today it's, it's a primarily Rideau operation. We have some uh, Ile-de-France crosses, again, producing a wonderful carcass, but a little bit bigger than the Toronto market really wants. So the straight Rideau is a, uh, is a better option for us. Uh, in order to use our facilities in our year-round lambing system, we don't lamb in large groups. We lamb every two to three weeks, and, uh, and, and I'm going to talk about our management group, but the idea is that we keep all parts of the operation busy by lambing every two to three weeks, which also means that we have labor every two to three weeks that has to deal with the, uh, with the lambing operation and the various stages of the, uh, of the sheep production. Uh, so today we're getting 266% drop. So the uh, Rideau ewes are, are dropping uh, through the year, 266. In the, in the, um, in, in the primary uh, lambing season, we get sort of mid-February through uh, uh, the beginning of May, we will have mostly triplets and, and then quads and uh, occasional twins. In the uh, summertime and, and the fall, we'll have more twins and occasional singles. And most of the ewes uh, are lambing most of you are lambing every 10 months, so it would be nice if it was more consistent on the eight month, but we find that October and November are very problematic. We can get used to successfully lamb in September and successfully lamb in December, but we're still having problems getting large numbers of ewes to lamb in October, November. So we're doing some adjustment in terms of pushing more ewes into the September lambing and then recognizing that those that don't catch will lamb in December. Right now we're at 6.2% uh, mortality. This is uh, uh, pre-weaning. Most, most lambs that die pre-weaning die in the first uh, one to three days. So we have stillborns and, and weak lambs that are, are big. If a lamb lives to be tagged, it hardly ever dies. So the very little mortality uh, after that. The uh, mortality that occurs in the feeder barn is almost all accidents. And, and if I could figure out some way to prevent the lambs from climbing into the feeder, we could probably eliminate that problem. But that's our biggest uh, after tagging issue is lambs that climb into the feeder and then get covered up with feed and uh, we just as much as all the changes and things we've done we still haven't quite figured out that issue but that that's a problem we're still working on and our our flock is closed we haven't introduced any new rams since 2007 but we do have a pretty wide genetics we purchased uh, uh, Rideaus from uh, six different sources and each one of those sources we attempted to get different lines uh, as well as some of the uh, earlier genetics that we have. So we don't, we don't right now see a problem with that and, and with 2300 ewes I don't think we'll have a problem for the next several years. 
Sales and marketing is, is really critical. People have to know whether it's a market animal or, or a replacement. They have to know the quality of what you're delivering. And, uh, and, and they can't only know that after their own experience. They have to come into the, to the purchase and, and have some awareness of your history. So we've done a, as much as we can to uh, communicate what we do. Uh, in Toronto, we're, we're lucky because we are a large enough operator that the buyers in Toronto insisted that Cookstown sell our lambs under our name. So when we go to Toronto, we, we, don't, get, uh, we don't get marketed as a Western Canadian lamb. We get marketed as Sardo sheep. And uh, that always helps us in terms of being able to get a better premium for the, uh, for the market animals. <laughs> Managing two objectives, is, and, and really the, the last point, a problem you must be removed. It's really easy to justify why that you lost your lamb. Or, or it's really easy to justify why that you is thin. The reality is if they lose a lamb or they're thin in your environment, it's your environment, and that you can't be there. So we have always been very uh, vigorous about removing any you who has any problems. If, uh, if for whatever the reason, it, it isn't our problem that, that you can't succeed in our operation and the you has to go. If you don't do that fairly religiously, you'll never end up with a flock which is truly self-sufficient. You'll always have these problems that you'll always have to deal with. And uh, it's, it's too hard, especially as you get larger and larger, to try and figure out why it is that you shouldn't ship that U. So the first uh, rule should be to ship any U that's causing you extra time. It just is the only way to be able to get a flock that looks after itself. So, and, and I'm not sure I mentioned this anywhere else, so I'll say it right now, we do not go into the barn after 10 o'clock at night or before 7 o'clock in the morning regardless of how many sheep are lambing. And I just got a note from my uh, farm manager. He came into the barn this morning. 24 ewes had lambed in the barn this morning. And all of those ewes had healthy lambs, and they'd all figure them out. So I don't think it's necessary to get up in the middle of the night, and it doesn't work. Right? At the end of the day, nobody has enough energy when you're lambing all year round especially, but nobody has enough energy to get up in the night to go into the barn. So we don't use video cameras, we leave the lights on. Or when, when our sheep are in the lambing barn, the lights are on 24 hours a day. We, we did find that, uh, you know, that that is an issue, that the, the lambs will and mothers will lose track of each other if it's too dark. So we have bright lights in the lambing area and the ewes and lambs generally figure themselves out. We had six sets of quads this morning and, uh, and some number of triplets, I can't remember, but they were all sorted out and that happens every day. I mean, sure, we have occasional problems where they get mixed up, but the, uh, the, the mortality level is very, very low even though we're not there during the night. And it's because the ewes, uh, our, our ewes have been selected that are willing to look after their lambs. So I, I really think that's a, one of the keys to uh, uh, us being able to grow with, with only three people is that uh, everybody gets a good night's sleep. And we continue to expect to get good night's sleep. So I mentioned that Cookstown we sell as our, we, our, as our sheep. We, um, we ship our lambs at uh, between 45 and actually 55 kilograms. They arrive between 45 and 50 kilograms. So that's our market weight in Toronto. Um, <coughs> so this number is actually wrong. It should say 50 to 55 and they arrive at 45 to 50. A another thing that, that has helped us and, and that's allowed us to be uh, more aggressive in culling is we try and ship our cull ewes in good condition. We don't ship our cull ewes so they can barely walk off the truck. We make sure that they're fattened up. Uh, a lot of our, our cull ewes that are being shipped are ewes that miss the lambing, so they're naturally in good condition anyway. But if they have a problem, we don't ship thin ewes. So when we get to Toronto, we're able to sell the culls as something that's valuable to the buyer. And uh, you know the cost of shipping is fixed. So you're, uh, you're better off not shipping something that uh, is at such a light weight that you're not going to get any return from it. And one of the things that's helped us, I mean, we are a larger operation, so it's easier, but, but Cookstown buyers can rely on us. So we have the same five people that buy from us every single week. Every time we ship, it's one of five people that buys. It's not people coming in off the street to buy. These five buyers always bid to buy our lambs, and they know they're going to come, so they can rely uh, in, in dealing with their customers that we're going to ship every two weeks. 
And if they need more, they give us a call and we can usually arrange to uh, ship some additional allowance. But we guarantee them that we're going to ship every couple of weeks. And uh, you know, we're typically shipping 100 lambs every couple of weeks at a, at a minimum. So they, they know that they're there. And again, this is an important marketing concept that we're trying to work you know, with the Canadian Lamb Co-op as well, that we'll be able to make commitments to uh, uh, customers that we're going to be shipping on a regular basis because we're going to be dealing with producers who are able to anticipate when their lambs are going to be ready. So here's our, our, our marketing sales system. We sell lambs from beginning to end. So we sell nursery lambs. Our, our nursery lambs are usually triplets and quads. So we have a, a number of people who are trying to grow their operations who buy nursery lambs. And they say, you know, this, they know they're getting a triplet and quad. So if they want to increase the fertility, a nursery lamb is a good place to go. We sell nursery lambs for $100 at typically three to four days once they're on the bottle. We don't sell lambs that are not yet sucking. We're not selling a lamb that's likely to die. We're selling a lamb which is already strong enough and established that it will drink on its own and it's not scouring. And, we, and, and again, we have a good market. Basically, all our ewe lambs get sold that are in the nursery get sold this way. There's hardly any ewe lambs that come out of the, the nursery and, uh, and, and go to, if they do, it's because they were scouring. Those are the only nursery lambs that uh, they don't get sold out of the barn. And we sell wean lambs, so we, we wean it two months, and then we take another month to make sure the lambs are going to take to feed and they're going to continue to grow, and we sell our replacement ewe lambs uh, at three months. Typically 35 kilograms, and uh, again, the market for this is, is quite strong for particularly lambs born early in the season because they can be bred that fall. So we, we have a, a very strong demand for ewe lambs that are born in the uh, sort of July to uh, January time frame because all of those lambs can be bred again in October. We, we usually breed at nine months. In 212, we uh, had 92% of the ewe lambs lamb at 145%. So uh, again, this, it's, I kind of like it when the, when the first lambing is a single. If a nine month old ewe lamb has a single, I'm quite happy with that because then she'll look after it, she won't get too run down and she'll be ready to have uh, twins on the second go around and then triplets after that. That would be the ideal sequence. So you'd have a, a single the first time, a twin the second time and triplets for the next five years. That would be perfect. If we could arrange everybody to do that, we'd all be happy. We sell uh, yearling ewe lambs, so we have a certain number of uh, ewes that we select. We call them white tag ewes, but these are ewe lambs that we're willing to put back into our flock. And then every year we sell three or 400 of those that are more than we need for ourselves. So we sell the wean lambs at 250 and the yearlings at 350. And we sell breeding rams at 400. Our uh, breeding rams that are sold are, are uh, pretty well all triplets and quads. Again, that's what people are, are coming to us looking for. They're trying to improve the fertility. So they typically want triplets and quads. Um, and, and we would recommend, uh, again, not strictly to be self-serving, but just to reduce the problems that if you're starting off, you should buy all of your sheep from one place. And, and avoid bringing in more problems than that one place is going to deliver to your operation. We also have a, uh, um, a, a program that, that I think is helpful and I think those of you who want to be uh, selling replacements should think about uh, offering your buyers a chance to work together with you on the farm for a period of time. Uh, we have a, a, a management document that we use but we also have a week of hands-on where people come to the farm, work with us for a week. So it's cheap labor, but it also is a good experience for them, right? They, they get to see in detail how uh, uh, things are done. And uh, that's been very effective. We've also added a website. If you are interested, the website is sardosheep.com. And uh, we're on, we have a Facebook site that's linked from that website. Uh, so that's the replacement side, which is kind of the focus of our uh, operation. We sell meat. Uh, we do some off-farm sale. This is clearly not something we want to do a lot of. It's too labor-intensive for us to uh, deal with people. Uh, everybody who comes to the farm wants a discount and they don't like what they get. So it's just too much trouble. Uh, but we do sell some of that. And we have a couple of retailers that, uh, that buy on a year-round basis and they come every month. We have one guy who comes every month, takes 17 lambs. And uh, I guess he comes every two weeks now. Yeah, 17 lambs every two weeks. Um, and we have a couple others that, that buy at certain times of the year. They'll buy uh, 30 or 40 for some event that they're hosting. 
But that isn't a big market for us, and it is, I think, anybody who's ever done this, or if you're thinking of getting into this, you, you need to establish some kinds of very strong commercial relationship. Uh, you know, people have to take what you give them, and there's no argument about price. Otherwise, it's just too labor intensive to, uh, to deal with individuals who want to buy. We also do sell animals into the university. We've done this from the very beginning. I was a professor at the university. I was connected with the Faculty of Medicine. So this is a limited operation, but it is a nice way to get $300 for a uh, ram lamb that uh, was otherwise going to go right now for $120. So. Wool, uh, yeah, everybody knows there's no money in wool. And uh, when you feed the way we feed, the wool is, is quite chaffy. So uh, the, the, our, our challenge isn't what to do with the wool. The challenge is to get somebody to come at the right time to shear it. Uh, we, we begin shearing in mid-February, although we're seriously considering um, shearing now on a, on a year-round basis rather than and, and not worrying about the uh, uh, December and January shearing. And the sheep are inside for a month, and uh, I, I think we, we probably will start to do that in order to reduce the moisture in the barns. Uh, we've, we've had quite a bit of problems this year where we had a, a group of sheep hung, uh, that were held over, and so there's too many sheep in the barn. It's way too wet in there right now. So. Um, it, it, if the sheep are in the barn for a month, I think they can go outside even in January weather without, uh, without too much grief as long as they have good feed. And, and our sheep are using in good condition. Uh, in terms of our operation, we have, uh, as I said, uh, three, three people plus myself on the farm. Uh, so I have uh, been non-resident from 1983 until 2010. Uh, I went to California for four months and turned out to be 10 years. So um, <clears throat> my scheduling isn't always as great as it could be, I guess. But uh, I'm, I'm back now full time. But, but during that time, my involvement was very much uh, you know, being able to deal remotely with the, uh, with the reporting and make decisions, investment decisions, based on what we were seeing in terms of the numbers and then communicating with, uh, with Raymond. So my farm manager has been there since 94, has a, a dairy farming background. And, and we've talked about this a lot. It seems to me that dairy farming background is probably an ideal way for people to get into sheep because the discipline is there, um, the understanding of the uh, of the the results and the impacts of, of the decisions you make and the programs that you put in place. Uh, it, it, we haven't found anybody else as successful as someone who's uh, actually run a real dairy farm uh, in in order to run the uh, sheep operation on a day to day basis. <laughs> we have a, a farm worker that doesn't speak very much English, but he has lots of muscle, and that is sometimes helpful. Uh, <clears throat> and, and my wife, uh, who looks after the nursery, so her involvement is much more intense when the nursery is busy and much less intense uh, otherwise. But I, she has now a large stick that keeps people away from the nursery. And I think the key with a successful nursery is to have someone who owns it. You can't have a nursery which is sort of a secondary uh, effect. It, it, it takes 15 minutes to get a lamb onto the pail. If you spend those 15 minutes, the lamb is self-sufficient from that point forward. If you don't spend the 15 minutes and the lamb gets weak, then you spend hours trying to get the lamb back up again. So the first 15 minutes of putting the lamb in the nursery are the most important parts of its life, and you have to have someone who cares about that and who does it all the time. And so that's my recommendation. If you want to have a, a big nursery, and we put 1,000 lambs through the nursery. Less mortality now in the nursery than we have in our, our, our lambs with ewes. And we often put the smallest lamb in the nursery. So this works. And along with the nursery, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that have to be done. I mean, the nursery can never be wet. The nursery has always to be clean. You know, the, the pails have to be clean, the nipples have to be clean, the, everything about it has to be as, as, as spotless and as carefully managed as you can make it. That's why you need a person to do it. It can't be uh, a task of someone who does it casually. It just doesn't work. We, uh, we grow most of our, our own forage, but not we buy all of our, our uh, grain. So we have, uh, in our area, 450 acres. It is a very sandy soil. We were talking about this last night. You know, a lot of Manitoba is rich clay soil. That was the bottom of the lake. We're the beach, right? So it's, it's very light, sandy soil. Um, we, the way we work it is a five-year rotation. So we, every year, we take 75 acres and seed it into a cover crop of peas and oats and alfalfa. 
and then the alfalfa is good for four subsequent years. Um, we find, and, and I'm not sure, maybe, maybe the, the climate here just doesn't work, but peas are really an excellent feed for sheep. You, this year the peas grew seven feet tall. So the only challenge is, if you've ever tried to bale a crop that's seven feet tall, <clears throat> that's an interesting challenge. But it produces a lot of bulk. There's a lot of feed, a lot of nutritional value in peas. And uh, as long as you make them as haylage, then uh, it's a very edible ration. If, if you try to make it as hay, it's, it's too coarse and it, it would be hard for them to eat. But as haylage, it makes a great feed. And uh, we've been doing this for, for a number of years now. And of all the things that we've tried, this is the best haylage that we make. Uh, and we, we make alfalfa haylage as necessary, really. We'll always try and make alfalfa dry if we can, but if it's going to rain, then we'll make it as haylage. Um, the other thing that, that we do is we, we spread the manure uh, on the field the year before. So we don't use any, any fertilizer beyond the sheep manure. So the, the straw manure combination provides all the fertilizer that's needed. We haven't used fertilizer for at least seven years, uh, even at seeding time. So the, 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 the mixture, the, the bedding, again, we're mainly corral, right? So our sheep are mainly in the corrals. There's a relatively small amount of time. So all of that manure that comes from the, from the bedding in the feeder barn, from the lambing barns, and from the corrals, uh, it records about uh, 2,000 tons on 75 acres. And, that's, and the soil has improved dramatically. Instead of being sandy now, it looks very rich. And, uh, so the, the value of, uh, of sheep manure, if you use uh, lots of straw bedding, is really quite substantial and should be taken into account when you're looking at your planning going forward. <laughs> and unlike hog manure, you can put as much sheep manure on as you want and it won't cause any problems with feed. For out-of-season lambing, we use MGA. Uh, so we, we found the sponges are just too labor-intensive. And well, the sponges, the original sponges also had a really bad tendency to have to be pulled out. You know, the string hung out, the other sheep would grab a hold and pull it out. The cedars don't have that problem, but they still are a lot of labor to uh, insert. For us, MGA seems to be fairly effective, except I must admit that, you know, October, November, we, we're still not getting the kind of lambing rate that we would like. Uh, but it's very easy to feed. You mix it in with a feed, feed it for 10 to 14 days. Uh, that prevents the use from cycling. Stop it. And, um, and, and here is just the opposite from what we do with uh, teaser rams. So our normal breeding cycle is to have the next ewes that are going to be bred in a pen beside the ewes that are being bred. So our teaser rams are the ones that are actually doing the breeding in one group, sitting beside the group that's going to be bred next. So it's a fairly automatic process. Once you see all the ewes lined up along the fence, you know they're ready to breed. Right? So that works very well, except with MGA. And it defeats the effect of MGA. If you let the ewes who are on MGA have any smell of a ram, it doesn't work. So you have to be very careful that you keep the rams a long way away from the ewes that are on MGA. The other part of the MGA program is, is once you remove them, from MGA, then five hours later, we use PMSG to inject. And the, really, the purpose of PM, PMSG is twofold. One, it's to increase fertility, so you increase the number, the rate of ovulation. But the second problem is that uh, out of season, you have more abortions. And a lot of these abortions are early abortions you don't even know. What PMSG does is it improves the, uh, the viability of an early lamb. So you re reduces the amount of stillborns you have particularly out of season with, with PMSG. So when you look at the value of PMSG, there is the one value, which is the extra lambs you get, and that's kind of measurable because you can see what you get with and without. What's less measurable is how many abortions you avoid. And that, you know, you can only really look at the total number of live lambs you have uh, in, in, a, in a cycle. And I think it's probably more significant. We did some experiments with this, and, and it, it looks to me like we're getting a 20 to 25 percent reduction in, uh, in stillborns with PMSG. So this looks to be like, it, it, it seems expensive, but it does seem to be worthwhile. And also the lambs being born out of season are more valuable, so the combination seems to make it worthwhile. Now light control, this, this is a, uh, you know, a controversy that's been going on in the sheep industry for years and years. The first thing I would say is that out-of-season lambing is, is, I believe, a lot more genetic than it is light control or anything else. 
So I think the first thing is that if you select ewes that were born out of season and breed them to rams that were born out of season, uh, or if you select ewes that are born as quads or triplets and breed them to rams that are born as quads and triplets, there's a lot higher probability that those ewes are going to lamb out of season than if you select a twin that was born in season. So that's the first and most, I think, most important criteria if you're looking to improve your out-of-season lambing. Now, in our particular case, we keep the lamb, we keep the lights on in the lambing barn and the feeder barn for 24 hours a day. So when the ewes are with lambs, the lights are on 24 hours a day. When we wean them and put them out, then they're going out into a shorter day. And so that combination is the easiest labor way that we can manage the lights because we got all our corrals lined up and it seems like even the tiniest amount of light has an effect on a, on a sheep. You have to put them in the absolute darkness if you want to change the uh, length of the day. It seems easier to go with 24 hour light to less light than it is to go with blackness to a certain amount of light. And there's a recent study that was published out of Quebec that seems to confirm this, which is somewhat contrary to what we've been reading up until now. Um, but that's the operation that we use, and, and for us, it, it works reasonably well. Um, again, minimized labor is our overarching. <coughs> By using TMR, we, we have our feeder set up in such a way that uh, we can st store three days of feed. So that's our design. All of our feeders are designed to handle three days of feed. And then we try and chop feed six days a week. So the intent is that we have three days of feed stockpiled and every day we add feed to that. So if something happens and we can't make feed, we've got a little bit of stockpile and then we don't make feed on Sundays. Um, as I mentioned, we, we want to make sure that the sheep never run out of feed. Um, and, and again, co use minimize handling. Yeah, there's, you may have noticed that when our, our ewes and lambs were being moved from the lambing barn to the feeder barn, they did that fairly automatically. Uh, we have a very standard moving system. The sheep move from one place to another every single time in the lambing cycle. And so they, they know. They know that pen 14 is where they go to before they're going to go into the barn for lambing. And as soon as we bring them into the barn and vaccinate, they run to pen 14. So it, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy. And, uh, uh, I think that, that doing things the same way is really good for sheep. They have a, you know, they, they like that idea of there's a standard way that things get done. There are no surprises. Uh, we don't have to think about what's going to happen. We know what we're supposed to do, and, and they just do it. So selection and culling, I, I've alluded to this earlier. We historically have been culling 20% uh, of our ewes, which you know, seems like a significant number, but that's what has allowed us to get to the point where our ewes are self-sufficient. And even today, we'll con we continue to cull 15%. The, um, the, the, the key here is that just because a ewe is 10 years old doesn't mean she should be culled. She should be culled because she doesn't perform. And I think that's... Um, it's something that, that we really need to look at. Uh, a ewe that, that comes out of lambing looking really thin is almost always your best ewe. And it's very important that you use the records to determine whether or not you're going to cull. Uh, a ewe that has quads and feeds those two quads so they uh, wean at 25 kilograms should be thin. Right? How the heck could she not be thin? The question is how quickly did she come back into condition? And, and, and it, when you go to breeder, is she in uh, condition and, and going to be able to carry a, a lamb uh, through to the next lambing? So, you know, a lot of people that I've talked to and, and farms that I've visited, what I see is that they're culling after lambing their very best use. And they're keeping the one that had the single and actually didn't lamb last year. And this you looks like she's in fabulous condition. No wonder, she fed one lamb in two years. Right? So almost always, the sheep that look, the ewe that looks the best is the worst. Now, there will be some ewes that are just plain past it, and they can't put on any weight. But it's very important to, to make sure that when you decide to cull, you've got a reason for culling, and the reason is the ewe's not performing. Uh, so we also cull vigorously on, on Miss Lambing Cycle. If a ewe doesn't lamb in season, there's no reason to keep that ewe unlikely that she's ever going to perform again. But for sure, you don't want to keep a ewe that doesn't lamb in the January to August time frame. I mean, everybody should lamb in that time frame. 
Uh, we are a, li a little bit more generous with uh, ewe lambs. If uh, they were young and they were bred late, then we'll give them a little bit more credit. Uh, and we're somewhat more generous in the uh, October, November time frame. But any ewe which has a lamb by January 15th that was bred to lamb in the fall is gone. Right? So they half the lamb or you have to move them out. For one thing, the way we feed, they get so fat when they don't lamb that you're gonna have other problems anyway. Right? If, you're if you're feeding a ewe to lamb every eight months and she misses a cycle, then she's probably got so much fat on that she's never gonna get in proper condition to lamb property again. But most importantly, if you're interested in year-round lambing, you have to keep ewes to lamb year-round. We don't like wild ewes, so uh, we, uh, and I, I don't want to be picking on anybody, but, but we did a, a pretty extensive experiment with Ile de France. We really liked the carcasses that they produce. These are crazy sheep, right? <laughs> they just don't work in, in our environment because... They're, they're just gliding. Yeah, so, and the fact that they run you over isn't helpful either. So, <laughs> so, you know, if you are doing a confinement operation, wild sheep are not part of your program. You need ewes that are nice and calm that will move from place to place, that don't have to be manhandled, that will stay with their lambs. You know, the, 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 the wild sheep has all kinds of problems. Uh, low weaning weights because she gets, every time something happens, she gets excited and runs away from the lambs. And the lambs have to find her again. You know, she runs over other people's lambs. She runs over the, the, the farmer, which is not good. And, and, you know, trying to move them through the chutes for sorting and so on, they, they make everybody else upset. So wildness is a bad habit, and, and certainly every variety of sheep can be selected for lack of wildness. I think this is a pretty inheritable characteristic based, based on my experience. Uh, certainly low lambing percentages will let a, 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 a ewe lamb have a single, and if a, a ewe has a quad and then follows that up with a single, that's sort of okay too. But second single and that's it. We never keep a ewe that has a second single. That you not only isn't she producing enough lambs, but you know she's not fertile, right? There's no way that a ewe should have a single in February, March, April, May. I mean, that's ridiculous. So if you're breeding for, you know, our type of lambing, you can't keep ewes that have singles. It just doesn't work. Uh, obviously, poor udders, but, but not only culling for poor udders, but you need to look in your replacements. You don't ever want to keep ewe lambs from a, a ewe that has a poor udder because that, that's just going to carry on. Problem is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be bad. <coughs> Weaning weights, the, probably the most, a, after lambing in season and with a proper percentage, the most important criteria is weaning weight. That's all the mother, right? It doesn't matter. The best ram in the world might give you a little bit better birth weight, but the weaning weight comes from the mother. How much milk did she provide? What, you know, how uh, dedicated was she at making sure that lamb was, was drinking regularly? So that's where we, uh, where, where we cull vigorously at weaning time. Uh, we won't keep anything that's less than 12 kilograms, and nowadays it's mainly 15 kilograms. And these are Rideau sheep, like these are, are straight Rideaus. This is not a Suffolk sheep. There's no reason why with the kind of milk that they can produce and access to creep that they're not gonna wean at 15 kilograms. The, the, the one thing that, that is very deceptive here is you've got a ewe that's got uh, triplets and the nursery lamb weaned at 20 kilograms and one lamb weaned at 25 kilograms and the other one weaned at nine kilograms. That probably tells you you gave the wrong lamb to that mother. So, so that, that is an exception that we will make. If we look at, at her lambs and we see that we got one real outlier, we recognize that we probably didn't get the ewes and lambs back together appropriately and she, she gave that lamb a, a little opportunity to nurse at the beginning so she wasn't so bad we took her out of the jug but later on when she got with the rest of the sheep she realized that wasn't hers and she wasn't going to let it eat and uh, so the fact that it survived is probably a miracle. And thin after weaning, so this is the point I already mentioned at the beginning, this, this is an area where Raymond and I have had some discussion but we're now on the same page. So here's a uh, <coughs> This is a, a ram lamb that we really like. Actually, yeah, we describe it here. So what we're looking for in, in my ideal world is a ram that's born a quad out of season and grows like crazy, right? There's the perfect ram. 
And so, uh, so we call that a Gretzky round, right? They're, 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 it's just as difficult to hire the, you know, the best possible person as it is to get the best possible ram. But for us, the best possible ram isn't for us. Like, understand this, we're, we're talking about a maternal line of sheep. For us, the best possible ram isn't necessarily the one that produces the best carcass. We would like that, but what we really care about is lots of lambs being produced throughout the year and healthy lambs that don't require any attention. If we're looking for carcasses, we'll use a terminal sire on that. But if we're talking about what we're selecting for our environment, building our flock, then we want a ram that uh, is fall-born, at least a triplet, that, you know, and, and avoid quins because you know, once you get beyond four, it gets to be a bit much. But um, we want mothers who lamb out of season on a regular basis with, uh, with low mortality uh, that, that are lambing for the third or fourth time and still have a very well-formed udder. The uh, you know, minimum birth weight of, of three and a half kilograms for a quad, 50 day, 21 kilogram, 100 day, 40 kilogram. I mean, there's a ram that everybody wants. And we have, we have two rams right now that uh, are the best of the best. You know, the, the, uh, I actually have a picture on my phone. I meant to send it to, uh, to Sue. But you know, th there are these rams that uh, uh, you know, exhibit all these, these characteristics and pass them on. And so what 189 did, he produced these two rams. So the reason the picture was there before was, this is a young ram breeding to uh, a group of ewes, produced, uh, you know, th this, these two sets of rams were both born quads to two different mothers. And those two mothers had eight consecutive periods of lambing every eight months. So that's the kind of ram I want to look for. Now that's where you need some information, right? In order to be able to, to look back and see that kind of history, you've got to be recording your data, you've got to be using the data, and that's where you know, the, the uh, R of ID system seems like a nuisance for a lot of uh, ways, but boy, as a simple way to calculate this or uh, gather this information and be able to report on it, this is what allows you to, to make these kinds of selections. Uh, there you these lambs were just weaned, so this is a just over two month ram lamb. And here's how we use these systems. So, so the rams I just talked about, for our ewes, what we do is we go through an analysis of our ewes and we, we look for ewes that are consistently lambing on an eight month cycle, that are consistently producing at least three lambs a year, um, that are, are having birth weights that are above our, our norm, and we select from those the top 20% of the ewes. So the, when, when that U comes in after lambing and we scan or tag, this message comes up saying, this is a 2012 January top 10% U. So we now know this is a candidate. We know that we should look at this U's lambs more carefully. If it doesn't come up with this note, the only other note that comes up that's, that's valuable is it says this U has consistently lambed out of season. Usually they're the same, but but a young ewe may not yet uh, classify as top 10% because she doesn't have enough records, but she has uh, cons lambed out of season twice. So those are the two things that we use to look at whether or not this ewe is producing lambs, which are candidates to keep. And then we go and look at the ewes carefully. If it doesn't say this thing, we're not going to look at the lambs as replacements. If, if one of those two messages doesn't come up, we do not look at those lambs as replacements. So again, we're managing by the numbers, right? It's too easy to look at a lamb that looks fabulous, but if you look back at the used records, you discover that she never raises two lambs to completion. Down the road, one of them always dies, or uh, she, she, the lambs are born at a good birth weight, looks like they're doing well, but they wean at 15 kilograms. You know, why would you want those as replacements? So this is the way to do it. The software makes it fairly easy to uh, do that kind of analysis, to create groups, and, uh, <coughs> and have these co standard comments come up. So selection and culling, we, we uh, look mainly, as I said, for fall-born replacements and uh, in-season triplets and quads. I think I've mentioned all this. The video gave uh, probably an overview, and, and you know th these handles will provide you with details if you're looking at at uh, configuration and so on. But uh, you know the lambing barn. The the only thing I would say about this is if I was building a lambing barn from scratch again, I would probably leave a dirt floor, in order to to let more of the moisture drain away. 
So the, the, uh, what we did in our feeder barn is we have dirt floors with uh, concrete uh, pillars in them, just enough so that the bobcat can rest on the concrete and not dig out too much of the earth. But otherwise, it's, it's dirt, and those stay much drier than the, uh, than the limey barn does. So there, it's not necessary, certainly, to have a concrete floor. The only benefit of it is it's easier to clean. But the downside is that there's no easy way for the moisture to drain away. We did put uh, drains in the floor, but really it all traps in the uh, straw and, and very little of it drains away. If you have a dry floor, then you can, um, you, you can move the moisture away. The other thing that we've done, and, and I, I would again recommend this, is when we built our, our lambing barn, we, uh, we intentionally divided it up with fixed walls. Um, the, the idea is if we have a problem in one barn, if we have a disease problem in one barn, it doesn't spread to the other barns. But also we can maintain different temperatures in different parts of the barn. So in the, in the, ju the jug part of the barn and the nursery part of the barn, we maintain higher temperatures. In the, in the nursery, the early lambs in the nursery have a heat lamp as well as a higher temperature. The lambs in the jugs are, are uh, maintained at a 15 degree centigrade temperature. The uh, area where we lamb out is uh, you know, 10 to 12 degrees centigrade. And then after that, so after they move out of the jugs and out of the, the eight pens, and they move down into the, uh, the next section of the barn where there's 24 using lamps together, there the temperature is just above freezing. And from that point forward, the temperature is enough above freezing that the uh, waters don't uh, freeze, but otherwise we're, we're using very little, very little supplemental heating. Having the individual walls allows you to do that. Right? It's not very expensive to put up those walls when you first build the barn, and it does allow you also to uh, clean out parts of the barn without having to clean out the whole barn at once. So uh, when, you, when you're thinking about setting up your operation, thinking about setting it up so that you can manage individual barns is probably wor uh, a worthwhile and maybe overlooked uh, item. The, um, the, the, the video shows the way in which our sheep eat. Every, except for the jugs, Every sheep eats in the same way, which has the benefit of the sheep don't have to learn how to eat again. Um, not, not as silly as you might think. If they, if they have to eat differently in different places, there's always some delay and there's some that are not going to quickly adapt to the new environment. They always eat through this, uh, this conveyor belt tarping. So they have to push the tarp out in order to get their head in to get access to the feed. Um, that, that has the benefit, it makes it more difficult for the lambs to climb through. It also means that the feed is constantly being mixed up. Every time they put their head through, the feed which is piled up in the outside is moving with that, uh, with that tarp. So it, we don't get any bridging that way. We don't have to come in with a pitchfork and, uh, and manipulate the feed. And, uh, and then we use that outside rake, which is uh, just, just a regular hay turning rake attached to a front end loader to go along and, and uh, fluff the feed up, basically push it back up into the uh, pile against the feeder. And that feed pile also makes sure that you don't get cold coming in from the outside combined with the tarp. So it's a very simple, you know, relatively inexpensive way to uh, feed, um, but it means that the feed's all outside, so the moisture from the feed is outside. It means that uh, you can feed from the outside so your equipment doesn't have to fit inside the barn. And it means that the, uh, uh, there's no place where the sheep can crawl on the feed or, or, uh, or trample the feed or manure the feed. So our, our sheep are always eating into an out area. Uh, they're not likely to pick up worms from uh, other sheep in that environment either. So we have uh, the barn divided up. We, uh, we did build a, uh, a shearing area in the barn. Again, if you want to be able to shear in the wintertime, you better have a comfortable place for the shear to come. It's hard enough to get them to come anyway if you uh, don't make it easy. So we, we not only have a warm place and a bright place, but we have a place where there's good handling facilities so that the sheep are always lined up waiting for them, and we don't have to help. You know, the, the sheep are in a pen and there's just a, a, uh, a press that moves the sheep down the uh, sorting chute and uh, into the holding area where the shear works. Uh, so we can easily shear 150 sheep in that area in a, in a few hours of the day. So we have a shearer who comes, um, he he's comes, he sets up, he shears on his own and he leaves and sometimes we don't even notice he's there. Uh, we just give him a call and tell him we got another batch of sheep ready to shear and he comes every couple weeks to do that. So 
again, I think you have to think about the shearer and the utility barn concept is good for that. It's also where the sheep come uh, to lamb. We bring our sheep inside just a few days before lambing. So uh, they come inside, they're sheared typically three days before lambing, two to three days before lambing. And we've never seen uh, abortion <coughs> problems or early deliveries related to that. Uh, having a professional shearer who does it quickly is probably an important part of that. And we're not professional shearers, we never shear. Uh, these are the jugs. A couple of things that I just mentioned. Um, all of our, all of our uh, handling facilities and gating and everything are made of metal, uh, but they're all galvanized. So I don't know uh, if, if other of you have, have experienced using iron, but uh, you know, iron is great because it's sturdy, it's easy to manipulate, but if the sheep manure gets on it, it uh, rusts and decomposes fairly quickly. So we typically see these things having a three to four year life when they're not galvanized and having a 20 year life when they are galvanized. So uh, galvanizing is not that expensive if you do it at the beginning uh, and painting doesn't work, the paint just peels off. So uh, galvanizing seems like the only mechanism if you're going to uh, uh, make your own feeders or if you're buying feeders, I would certainly look at feeders which are galvanized as opposed to ones which are just straight iron um, just from a, a length of time. The other thing is that uh, these feeders are five by five. So uh, again, recognizing our sheep are not gigantic, but when they have triplets and quads in the pen together, we don't want them laying on the lambs. So uh, this gives them enough space that they don't typically, uh, we don't typically see that problem. We, we uh, the jugs, the black pails are our uh, feeding and watering pails. So the only time we hand feed is in the jug. Um, and uh, you know, there's been some debate about that. We could put up an automatic uh, watering system so we didn't have to do that, and we could think about some kind of automatic feeding system. The excuse for feeding by hand is it forces you to look in the pen at the lambs every day. And we see a lot of problems that we probably wouldn't see otherwise uh, by doing that. So that, that's our main justification for not going with an automated system is it forces us to spend uh, a minute or so every day looking at those new lambs with the mothers and making sure that we see any problems. And that's about what it takes. It takes about a minute to fill up the feeder and, uh, and the water pail. One thing that, if you're using this type of jug, one thing that we do that, that I would strongly recommend is we empty the water pail between, whenever we move the sheep and lambs out, we empty the water pail. And the reason for that isn't cleanliness, it's because the next ewe that's come in is gonna drop her lamb into the watering pail. So if the watering pail's empty, it doesn't matter. Right. It's full of water. But it is also a good cleanliness. Uh, How many jugs do you have? 55 jugs. For 144 ewes. For 144 and four of the jugs have head gates. I don't think I have a picture of the head gate <laughs> here. But, um, so the, the, the jugs at each end are head gates, and, and that seems to be enough. We don't typically see a demand for more than four head gates. There you go, 55 jugs. <laughs> um, I think this is pretty much what I said. The, uh, yeah, <coughs> the alleys are designed in such a way that when the gate opens, it provides a, uh, a block. So the, the sheep can either be brought into the jug or leave the jug, and they can only go in the direction that you uh, want uh, by opening the gate. So simple mechanism, but if you had a five foot alleyway, then you'd have problems with the, uh, the gates going by. So uh, it's, and, it's good to uh, try and use your handling facilities um, to, to make the sheep go where you, where you want them to go. And otherwise, I think we, we talked all, oh, the head gate, yeah, just, we, we, we will usually leave a U in the head gate for three days, but honestly, within a few hours, you know. Uh, most of our ewes, if they reject a lamb, or if we're trying to get her to take an orphan lamb, most of them will uh, either accept the lamb or not once they've got their head in the jug. And uh, if, they, if they do accept it, then we just give them a few days just to make sure that when they let the lamb loose, it's, it's gonna smell like her lamb and she won't have any problem with that. And I would say that now 90% of the time when we put a ewe in a head gate, she accepts the lambs. So, and we don't usually um, cull a, a ewe until she's in a head gate twice. So if she's in a head gate once, then uh, we may well have given her the wrong lambs, right? So uh, we give her one opportunity. But if she's in a head gate twice, then she's gone after that.
so here's our, our nursery startup. So we, the, our nursery system has three steps. We, if we have a quad or a triplet, we will identify right away who's going to go into the nursery. And we will attempt to give uh, those lambs with the mothers uh, a taste of the bottle when their sucking instinct is really strong. So right after they're born, right after they've got colostrum, we'll put them onto a bottle and give them a couple ounces. And whether the mother has a ton of milk or not, it's just so that they get the, the taste of the, of the milk and, and the use of uh, the familiarity with the bottle. And then we move them into the nursery on the second day when we tag the ewes. So second or third day, depending on when the ewes get tagged, that's when the lamb goes to the nursery. And the nursery pail is used at the beginning because it's easier to suck from a pail than it is to suck from the tubes. So they'll be in the pail for a couple days. Once they're uh, sucking aggressively, then they move into the uh, nipple bar, which is uh, attached to the uh, automatic milking machine. And there they have to suck more firmly because they're pulling it through a, uh, a longer tube. And, um, and so we want to make sure that they know what they're doing and, and they don't get frustrated. You leave two lambs on each. We leave two lambs on each you, only two, right. And again, the reason for that isn't necessarily that the U doesn't have enough milk. It's because we don't want the U to get too run down in condition uh, and not be able to rebreed. So, and the uh, nursery typically uses a half a pail or half a bag of, of uh, milk replacer uh, gets a, a nursery lamb to one month, and that's when they're weaned. So it's, it's about $30 to, uh, to feed out a nursery lamb. And we find that nursery lambs now are weaning at about the, at two months at about the same weight as, as a uh, uh, lamb with the mother, and they go to market at the same rate. So there's, there's really no, no loss of uh, productivity, but there is that additional $30 to, uh, to feed. And uh, the, the offsetting advantage is the mother doesn't lose condition. So, yeah, last year we had 1,000 nursery lambs. So uh, we've kind of scheduled for, for 600. But uh, 600 is about what we fed. About 400 of our nursery lambs were sold as, uh, as ewe lamb nursery lambs. Um, so we're saying $40 for the milk replacer. So maybe the milk replacer is more expensive. It's a half a bag in any case. Wean it 30 days. Um, Cleanliness, yeah, this is something that, that uh, we were talking about earlier, but I think that, that one of the things that you need to be, maybe people need to be more sensitive to in the nursery than, than maybe is the normal case, is how important it is to keep uh, that whole nursery operation clean. Because uh, um, scouring and cryptospermidia are, are very common in nursery lambs. ORF is very common in nursery lambs. And what we found is that by uh, uh, you know, cleaning the pails out with, with good hot water and, uh, and Javex between every filling, and uh, when, we, when we change out the uh, tubes, we, we make sure that um, the tubes are, are changed out every three to four weeks the, the, from the milking machine to the uh, nipple bar. And the, the nipples themselves are and the bar around the nipples are cleaned every day. Uh, we've dramatically reduced our incidence of wharf or sore mouth, and uh, we've dramatically reduced our, uh, our scouring. Although I will tell you that my new wife ended up with ORF, Cryptos Media, and uh, E. coli last year. So her first year of working with sheep was an interesting experience. <laughs> so these are the holding pens. So we move from the jug to the holding pen. So the jug is a, the U lambs in an area. They, they move into the jug for, for one to three days, depending on, or four hours like we have right now. But normally we like them to be one to three days. And then we move them to these eight pens. And the, uh, the way in which we move is, is a, the, the video described that a bit. We move four ewes and their lambs on the first day. And uh, uh, we have eight of these pens. So that allows us to move 32 ewes and lambs. And then the next day we move the next group of 32 ewes and lambs. Uh, the idea is to try and make sure the ewes and lambs know each other. Because this is a problem when you move them into bigger groups. It's easy for the ewes to lose track of the lambs. So this system of moving them into a single pen, moving them into an eight pen, and then moving them into a 24 pen, um, and potentially into a, 
uh, a, 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 a larger area outside if we, if we have to do that, means that the ewes and lambs are well bonded, and so we don't really have much problems after that with uh, ewes and lambs losing track of each other. So these are our, um, our lambing pens. Um, <coughs> everything in our, and I'm going to come to the management group concept, but everything in our operation is designed ar around a group of ewes that are 144 in size. All of our penning is then designed to be a subset of that 144. So we lamb in pens of 72 ewes at a time. So the, the, the lambing barn is divided into two halves. There'll be 72 ewes in each side, and they'll lamb in that pen and then move into the jug. Okay, so um, that may be a little big, you know, in, 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 there's, a, there's an option for sure to divide those in half and have 36 ewes in each pen. The, the, the trade-off is it's then harder to clean. So this reduces the amount of uh, work when we want to go and clean uh, in terms of the penning that we have to take down to be able to clean it out. The, um, it, it's hard to describe, but we do have um, an occasional ewe that's not really friendly towards your lambs. So uh, we have a mechanism with a, with a gate, a folding gate, that we can use to trap the ewe and take her out uh, in order to get her to be with her lambs. It, almost have to come and see that to appreciate it. But think about the fact that you've got a pen with 72 ewes in it. Um, you go and you take her lambs out and she doesn't follow them. How do you get that particular ewe to follow you out? Uh, the mechanism we use is just a gate that's flexible with, with joints so that you can trap that ewe and move her out to the gate and have her go out into the alleyway. And then at that point, she's usually quite willing to stay with her lambs. But um, trying to manhandle a ewe out of a pen is not any... It, it's, uh, it's the same steel that we use for the rest of the gates, but it's hung on the wall, so it, the hinging means you don't have, it's no effort to move, yeah. So there's the lambing pan. Oh, here's the thing on the wall, see? Yeah. Right? So it, it's hinged, it's got three piece, three hinges, and a, and a hinge on the wall here, but these three pieces move independently, so you can kind of trap the U behind it and move her over into the corner, and if you get three or four U's, then you can get the other U's out, and then you just take the one that had the lamb out. So it also reduces the disruption, right? They're not running into each other, because you can move fairly slowly and get that lamb uh, or that U into the uh, corner and then out the door. This is particularly great for ewe lambs who are never cooperative, right? So, so after, after the eight pen, they move into these uh, 24 pens, and here we have four of these. Um, they're divided in half, so there's 48 ewes in a barn and four barns. Free access to creep for the lambs, and they're moved outside uh, uh, after 30 days. And if we, uh, if we move them outside, then we move two groups together, so 48. Uh, into an outside uh, pen. If we move them into the feeder barn, we usually keep them as groups of 24. And here's our, this is our feeder barn. You can see that it looks like, you know, there's an awful lot of unused space inside this feeder barn. But in fact, this space is, um, is used all the time and, and it's very convenient. You do have to, unless you're doing all the work, you have to think about the people that work in your operation. What this does is it gives us a place to be out of the wind, out of the rain. Um, the, the sheep are, are maintained dry because they're in the feeder barn under shelter. We move them into the corrals. Uh, we can use them there for holding when we're shipping. We can use them for sorting when we, when we wean. We can use it for weighing. Um, we can uh, use it when we're cleaning the barns out. You know, each, each one of these pens is, is managed by a gate, and the two gates come together to block off the alleyway. So we can create as many corrals inside the uh, feeder barn as, as we need, one for each of the 38 uh, uh, pens that we have in the barn. This, this uh, circular chute with a squeeze that goes into the, uh, into the uh, run, and the run goes into the weigh scale. And I think the weigh scale was shown on the, uh, on the video. But it's a, a fairly simple system. It's, uh, we've used it for 20 years, and uh, it, it works well. It, it's uh, sturdy enough that it uh, stays up. I think the biggest change that we made over what we bought was the, uh, the uh, squeeze itself, the metal that was in 
this part of the squeeze from the original version was too flimsy. And so I would watch out for that. If you're, if you're gonna put a bunch of sheep in there, it, there's a lot of stress on that. So uh, we replaced that with a more vigorous, but otherwise everything else has been the same corrugated metal from the beginning. So the feeder barn is 380 feet long. Uh, it's a, uh, um, a rafter span, so there's no uh, internal uh, poles. Uh, we use tarps to uh, keep the wind out, particularly from the north side. So we have tarps that, are, that can be moved up and down um, and uh, divided into pen 26 by 24. So 24 ewes and lambs uh, can be uh, put into one of those pens. The pens have a, uh, a, a lamb only shoot between them so one one pen will be used for lamb creep and the other pen for just use and the lambs can go back and forth get at still get at the mothers for uh, uh, to nurse but uh, have access to the creep center alleyway is 18 feet wide so it's big enough to handle our tractor and, and mill for unloading and we unload th in this case the uh, feed is in bunks so this is the one place this is the same head feeder it, it feels the same for the use but actually the feed is stored in a bunk not outside uh, <coughs> the main reason we did that was in order to make sure that there was adequate ventilation. When we, when we, in this barn, when we put feet on the outside wall, we ended up with not enough airflow in the barn. And so there was too much pneumonia uh, in the uh, interior corral. So we went with the bunk so that they always had uh, the outside area uh, exposed and lots of airflow going through. Uh, and we really have no pneumonia in the feeder barn. We, I, we, I can't remember the last case of pneumonia we've had in the feeder barn. Uh, the, the only issue that we continue to have to deal with is mastitis in the ewes. And uh, you know, one of the main ways that we're managing that is making sure that the bedding is as dry as possible. So we, we keep bringing fresh straw in. But uh, these ewes are heavy milkers. They, uh, they have to dry up, but they also have to uh, have good dry feed. Otherwise, uh, the bacteria will, will build up. use on pasture. We have page wire. Uh, all of our corrals or all of our uh, farm is divided up with page wire fencing so that there's not too much stress when the ewes are, are on each side. We never breed on the pasture so our uh, our rams are bred and our rams are going into the ewes in a corral. They're bred in a corral so the rams will go out but by that time the ewes are all bred. So no ewes go out onto the pasture who haven't already been bred. So we don't have contention there with the rams trying to break the fence down. Um, our corrals are uh, yeah, 96 by 100. The uh, 144 ewes again uh, connected to the pasture. The, uh, we have a, a fence line feeder. I'm, I, I'm not sure whether you noticed in the video, but our fence line feeder does have a small roof over it to uh, stop large amounts of moisture from coming down on the feed. And also for the ewes, they can be then standing under that shelter. So they seem to be more willing to get up and eat when it's raining or especially cold rain than they would uh, if they couldn't get out of it. If they had to stand there in the cold rain, they'd come and nibble a bit and run back under the shelter. Uh, this way they tend to stay uh, there uh, eating out of, the, out of the weather. And the, the concrete pads are just to make sure that they're, you know, they're, it doesn't get too muddy and it's easy to clean in front of the feeder. And then we have the pole barns. Uh, uh, the pole barns are in the center uh, well, they're, they're the, a divide a corral. So the pole barns are, are uh, on each side of, of one corral with the fence running down the middle. So they're 48 by 48, but half of each side is used for a group. And this is the way the, the feed system works. The feed is piled along the edge. Again, every feeder is the same. This is the little roof I was talking about. And uh, these alleyways that are between the feeders are where we use to move the sheep around. Each one of our pens is numbered so we can keep track of the uh, of the management group. So this is one of our outdoor ewe and lamb feeders. And that's the, the ewe lamb feeder 32 by 32. The, um, the one thing with the, the, ewe f the ewe corrals are just pole barns. They have no covered sides. The ewe and lamb feeders are covered on three sides so that in the winter when they're outside they're, they have more protection from the wind and the rain. And the uh, uh, the creep area is a, is completely under cover, so the lambs go into that. They don't have to be out in the uh, in the weather. They don't have to get wet. Yeah, 
Yeah, the young lambs can eat from the feeder because a certain amount of feed always comes under. That's why the tarp doesn't go to the bottom. There's a certain amount of feed that comes through. But really, we want the lambs to eat in the creep. So that's where they get most of their feed from. This, this is a creep back here. And so there's two barns here uh, divided by a creep. Maybe we're at the end. <laughs>